to do that. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending where you are. Um, thank you everybody for uh, attending today's event. We, we're very happy to host this event today uh, on a very important topic. Um, the event coincides with the release of a new report by the Program on Extremism titled Dollars for Daesh, Analyzing the Finances of American ISIS Supporters. Uh, the report is authored by Program on Extremism Research Fellows John Lewis and Andrew Mines and myself, and reviews the financial activities of more than 200 US-based Islamic State supporters, basically everybody that has been indicted for ISIS-related activities. Um, the report builds on a database of ISIS cases uh, we have created years ago and constantly updated and supplements all the work that we at the program have done on various aspects of the ISIS related mobilization. Uh, in the past, uh, in fact, we have analyzed radicalization trajectories, attacks, online behavior, uh, what we call the travelers, uh, uh, US foreign fighters, basically. Uh, and we now wanted to concentrate on another very important aspect uh, of, uh, of the ISIS mobilization in the States, which is financing. I'm old enough to remember when financing was described as the lifeblood of terrorists. That's no longer fashionable to say. Uh, and even though I would say the topic has to some degree been getting less attention than we used to get some 10, 15 years ago, we think it's extremely important to understand how funds flow in out of and within the US to support terrorist activities. So this new report, which I urge you to download from our website, we also put up the, put up the link on, uh, on Twitter, analyzes the tactics ISIS supporters in the US use to raise and move funds and several aspects related to their finances. Uh, my colleagues uh, will now outline its main findings. Uh, let me just say that it's the fruit of very meticulous research by the program staff, uh, which entailed both reviewing thousands of pages of core documents and conducting interviews with a broad range of national security professionals. Uh, let me also say that the report was made possible thanks to the support from the National Counterterrorism, Innovation, Technology and Education Center and site, of which we are proud to be members. Uh, Without further ado, let me briefly describe today's event. Um, first, my colleagues Andrew Mines and John Lewis will present the report findings. When we, then we have the pleasure of being joined by two top experts on the subject, Catherine Bauer and Jessica Davis. We will hear their feedback and comments on the status of terrorism financing in the US and abroad. And then we will take questions from the audience, even though I have to, to remind everybody that we have to end today's event at the top of the hour, uh, but you can type in your questions. Uh, we'll try to answer as many as possible. So to keep things uh, short, let's get started. And uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Lorenzo, and, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this event. Um, as we get these slides prepared, I want to quickly give a shout out to the POE team, of course, uh, for their excellent feedback and support as always. But um, also to the, the, the small army of very talented research assistants who helped us with this report uh, and to our partners at Insight. You've all made this report uh, possible and support us in helping it reach a wide audience, so thank you. Um, as Lorenzo mentioned, I'll, I'll keep my remarks a little over five minutes in, in providing you with an overview of the report uh, before I hand it over to John and he can take us into some of the more interesting case studies. Uh, this report encompasses a group of individuals who have entered the US legal system because of crimes associated with their support for the Islamic State, um, a group that we at the Program on Extremism call, in part, ISIS in America. And publicly, we know that there are at least 209 individuals who fall under this umbrella as of August 31st. Uh, but I should note that this month, several more individuals were either uh, arrested or successfully repatriated from abroad uh, after having joined the group, bringing that total to 215 today. Uh, we continue to track these cases as they progress, and you can find them both on our website and in our monthly updated GW Extremism Tracker, which we'll be releasing soon for the month of September. So do be on the lookout for that. Um, as Lorenzo mentioned, we source a lot of our information from thousands of pages of publicly available court documents, uh, which you can also find in both outlets I just mentioned. These documents are excellent primary source materials and you'll find that they help provide a lot of information in terms of the various behaviors of ISIS supporters in America, and also in terms of their motivations and decision-making processes. For this report, 
we wanted to look specifically at the financial dynamics that shape those outcomes. And from a policy perspective, to identify any uh, relevant factors for our consideration. To do so, we broke each of these cases down into three core components, uh, which will hopefully be intuitive from uh, how we've labeled them here. First, fundraising tactics, the ways that ISIS supporters acquired funds and assets to support their activities. Uh, second, movement tactics, uh, the various mechanisms that supporters used to move funds within their networks and or across state and international lines. And finally, support networks. Uh, those are the type of interpersonal networks that individuals did, and in many cases did not draw on to support their activities. Um, I'll quickly cover our top level findings for each of those core components in the next three slides. When it came to fundraising, we found that most supporters really were able to pursue their goals by staying within the bounds of their own personal or family savings uh, and income sources. Around a quarter turned to additional legal means to raise funds, uh, the vast majority of which simply received donations from individuals within their social networks. Uh, some decided to liquidate their assets to raise funds, cars, uh, firearms in some cases, miscellaneous personal belongings. We found that usually this was meant to fund travel abroad uh, to join the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and happened around within a week of their intended dates of departure. Those who turned to additional illegal means of fundraising really were the exceptions to the rule, less than a tenth of the entire sin, uh, and even fewer a less than a handful uh, turned to violent crime at that. Certainly, we saw a lot of Islamic State propaganda since the group's inception almost, calling on its Western supporters to commit various uh, financial crimes in their home countries on behalf of the organization, but very few in the US, at least, uh, seem to have decided that that was the pathway for them. As far as movement tactics go, uh, we really noticed a wide array of mechanisms being used. Many supporters defaulted to physically transporting funds and assets, whether because it made sense logistically or because of operational concerns that uh, they would be discovered by monitoring government agencies. Kind of along those lines, we, we found that supporters much preferred money service businesses outside of traditional financial institutions rather than wire funds directly from their bank accounts. Uh, we were able to find a number of uh, messaging conversations actually used as evidence in several prosecutions that ISIS supporters had some basic awareness of financial monitoring mechanisms and tried to circumvent them as a result. There are a few outliers to those trends. Uh, John will walk us through those in a bit. And finally, we come to uh, support networks. The majority of ISIS supporters in America fit into this kind of broad bucket of loan financial actors. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were loan actors in their support efforts, but that they simply didn't incorporate others in the, in the financial sides of their plans. Uh, we have a few examples of individuals exchanging funds across international lines with other ISIS supporters overseas, uh, but these were almost always travel oriented uh, to help one another get to ISIS's physical territory. Uh, direct exchanges with definitive ISIS operatives, um, also rare. We found only one case involving a more sophisticated money laundering plot uh, by ISIS's external operations wing to finance an attack in the US. Again, John will, John will cover that case shortly. Um, and lastly, we found no indication of charitable entities being set up or used to funnel money in and out of the US on behalf of ISIS. This is a, this is a marked difference from the MO of other organizations, past and present, and perhaps speaks to a successful deterrence factor in uh, counter financing tools and policies, at least in this setting. So kind of pulling all of these observations together, it's fair to say that ISIS supporters in America left a small and unsophisticated financial footprint. Many of the financial dynamics we observed were action oriented. That is, they were meant to directly facilitate US-based ISIS supporters themselves. Uh, but this should come as no surprise. We know that ISIS substantially lowered the threshold for activities that qualified as support in the organization's eyes, and only a small amount of dollars were really needed to carry out those activities at the end of the day. It should also be of no surprise that uh, fundraising and movement tactics involved a combination of old school and new school uh, mechanisms and tactics. We know that terrorist groups and actors are innovative and early adopters of new tools and technologies, but they'll also use tried and trusted means if that's what gets the job done. Along those lines, we do flag in the report the relative absence of cryptocurrency usage. Um, again, I'll leave the counterfactual case to John in his remarks, but it's worth noting that 
the actual use of cryptocurrencies was extremely rare. There are a number of reasons why that might be, and, and perhaps we can cover those in our discussion later, but I think until we see more widespread distribution of instructional financial material related to cryptocurrencies, and from the bottom up, grass rates, innovative efforts, it's unlikely that we'll see more widespread terrorist adoption of and certainly successful use of uh, cryptocurrencies in the near future. Um, but for now, we've promised you all some interesting outliers, and I'll hand it over to John to cover some really interesting case studies. John? Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Thanks to uh, Lorenzo and all of you for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm very excited to kind of cover uh, very quickly uh, several of what we viewed as notable and important outliers uh, when we're crafting this report, kind of like Andrew laid out. Uh, most of the financing in this, in this report was um, one or two individuals, relatively low level, which um, as we detail uh, in the report itself, presents kind of this unique challenge to law enforcement. Um, but what I want to do today very briefly is cover a couple cases that we think represent um, some unique outliers that um, also represent a um, area of concern going forward uh, in relation to how ISIS and other homegrown violent extremists um, have or may continue to uh, try and materially support um, terrorist organizations overseas. Um, the first case I wanted to lay out briefly is Jason Brown. Um, he was arrested in 2019 and um, described as a member of the AHK street gang in Bellwood, Illinois. Um, at the time of his arrest, um, he was reported to have uh, been requiring members of this street gang to convert to Islam and continue to attempt to um, radicalize them and um, inspire them to support uh, the Islamic State. Um, he had numerous conversations with individuals, according to the complaint, in which he uh, detailed his support for the Islamic State, his desire to join the group overseas, and over the course of um, 2019, he had given um, three uh, $500 donations to an individual uh, with the belief that these funds will be used um, overseas to support uh, the Islamic State. I think this case is especially interesting because um, we hear anecdotally a lot um, of discussion of this crime terror nexus. Um, and more often than not, especially in the US context, we don't see many uh, real world, real life instances of it, but at least as this case continues to progress, um, I think we expect to see some more information about kind of how this individual attempted to um, finance and fundraise his own efforts to continue to materially support uh, the Islamic State. Um, the next case, very briefly, um, Hamid al Shanawi. Uh, this is the only known case in the US of an individual who um, received directly finances from the Islamic State overseas to direct a plot in the United States. Um, in 2015, he was connected with uh, Sifil Sujan, um, an individual who directed the group's computer operations, which was a role um, previously held by Junaid Hussein. Um, Sujan used this. Um, British company to um, send funds to El Shanawi in the US, as well as through uh, several intermediary companies with the goal of providing him with the funds necessary to um, initially assassinate an unknown individual. And then later, uh, they sent him step-by-step -step instructions to construct a peroxide bomb. Um, while this ultimately did not, did not come to pass, um, this case is especially notable because as, we, as I said, it's the only instance that we know of at this time in which an individual directly sent funds to a US-based individual. Um, and I think that what we need to look at here is while the Islamic State has obviously lost the caliphate, we should continue to be on the lookout for instances in which, whether it's um, recruitment, whether it's inspiring, whether it's direct fund transfer, um, targeting of, of US individuals uh, in that context. Um, the last two cases I want to cover are, I think, uh, some of the most notable ones that we find uh, in this data set. Uh, the first, obviously, is Samantha El Hassani. Um, she traveled with uh, her husband, her brother-in-law, and two minor children uh, to the Islamic State in 2015. Um, but prior to that travel, she made, I believe, three trips to Hong Kong uh, with her minor children. Um, she liquidated her entire assets. Um, she sold her car, she sold her house, she melted down her gold, and she brought all those funds uh, to a safety deposit box uh, in Hong Kong with the intent to um, make use of those funds when they traveled to the Islamic State. Um, 
she, she knowingly concealed the nature and um, source of those funds and what they'd be used for. She did so in an attempt to get around uh, the US system for detecting these types of instances. Uh, she didn't disclose them on her travel forms. Um, she helped her husband purchase this tactical gear overseas. Um, and I think this case is, is a very informative one for what, we, what we're seeing a lot more of where individuals that support ISIS are keenly aware of um, what the FBI is looking for and what DHS and TSA are looking for um, when you are traveling. I think we all know now there's this very well-worn path where an individual who is flying to Turkey as a transit destination with $9,500 in their bag um, is going to get stopped and going to get looked at. I think individuals who are following what's happening and trying to support this group um, are adaptable, they're intelligent, they're aware of what the rules are. And they, I think more and more often what we're seeing is these individuals are trying to leverage their expertise to get around uh, the current kind of counter financing regimes that um, domestic law enforcement is trying to, trying to use. Um, and that brings me to the final case, Zubi Shanaz. Uh, this is the largest known um, amount of money transferred to the Islamic State by a U.S.-based person uh, in, our, in our whole set. Um, again, fraudulently applying for credit cards. Um, she took out a fraudulent loan um, and she purchased over $62,000 in cryptocurrencies. Um, she converted these funds to U.S. dollars and then began transferring them to shell companies overseas. Um, this case is fascinating, um, not just for the cryptocurrency aspect, but because she made this case so complicated. She, she purchased cryptocurrencies fraudulently. She took out a loan fraudulently. She then transferred the funds back into US dollars. She sent them to shell companies in China and Pakistan um, in an attempt to, to disguise her, the true nature of what she was doing, um, in an attempt to send this money to the Islamic State prior to her travel uh, to the group. Um, and she was ultimately, uh, as you can see there, arrested and charged with trying to travel to join the group uh, in 2017. She pleaded guilty and was sentenced in, in 2020. Um, very quickly, takeaways, like I said throughout, um, these are obviously outliers. Like Andrew said, it's mostly low level. Uh, it's mostly individuals who have personal savings or who, you know, one or two individuals who have a completely legal, um, not notable source of income, uh, who attempt to purchase a gun or purchase a plane ticket with what they already have on their person. Um, but I think, like I've said throughout, what these cases show is um, this is an adaptive threat. This is a threat that is not going away. This is a threat that um, these individuals will continue to seek to support the Islamic State and other overseas jihadist organizations um, in whatever way they can. Um, and I think that these individuals will continue to, um, you know, it's a cat and mouse kind of game, right? They will, you know, if we raise the, the, the reported amount at an airport from 10,000 to 20,000, or from 10,000 down to 5,000, they would simply bring 4,500 with them. Um, so I think that these cases show that while it is largely low level, um, that there are always going to be individuals who attempt to or successfully um, get, around, uh, get around the system. Uh, and I will, I will leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you, Andrew. Um... I think that was a perfect uh, um, overview of the report. And again, let me uh, repeat that the report is now available. We released it today. You can find it on our website. Uh, uh, we put the link on, uh, on Twitter uh, and so on. So please um, download it and check it out. Um, now, um, given these findings, uh, I would really like to get the, the thoughts and the feedback from uh, um, our two uh, discussants. Uh, and I cannot think of better uh, discussions to have than uh, Catherine Bauer and Jessica Davis. Uh, I don't think they need an introduction, but just in case, let me briefly introduce them. Um, Catherine Bauer is the Blumenstein Katz Family Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and a former U.S. Treasury official who served as the, as the department's financial attaché in Jerusalem and the Gulf. She's also an adjunct associate professor in the Security Studies program at Georgetown University. We're not going to hold that against you. Uh, Jessica Davis is the president of Inside Threat Intelligence, an international consultant on counterterrorism and intelligence, and former senior strategic analyst with the Canadian Security Intelligence. Um, let me start with Catherine, uh, and particularly from a US point of view, and as somebody who served uh, 
um, in some of the entities that look at uh, specifically this kind of stuff. What do, you, what do you make of these dynamics, which are, as we said, quite different from, uh, from the past, quite different from what we have seen uh, when the big problem was, uh, was Al-Qaeda, or quite different from, uh, uh, from other groups. So your first reaction to seeing uh, these kind of dynamics, uh, put it also in the perspective of what does that mean for those who have to counter uh, this phenomenon? Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, and thank you to the Program on Extremism for inviting me to join this conversation. Um, it is one of my favorite topics. Um, and congratulations to the three of you for the publication of this report. I think it's a, it's a valuable contribution to the literature that's looked at this phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters and lone actors, small sale um, uh, terrorist organizations that are kind of as a group less vulnerable to the traditional counter-terrorist financing tools. And I, I believe that it's the first real data-driven um, comprehensive analysis looking at the role of finance in, um, in IS-related activity in the United States. So again, congratulations on that. One of my big takeaways kind of overall from, from looking at this report was actually that you were able to pull together this kind of data. Um, the fact that court records and investigations and prosecutions included this much financial information. Um, and I don't think that should be taken as a given, but I think it's an indicator of the value of this kind of information and the important role that it plays in investigations and prosecutions. Um, even when financial charges aren't being brought, the ability of financial information, which is nearly immutable to demonstrate relationships, to um, account for or demonstrate intent and sometimes even priorities, it's an incredibly valuable resource. And I think it's one that um, you know, hasn't always played this role. I think if you look at the 9-11 Commission report, they detail the challenges that law enforcement faced prior to 9-11 and kind of bringing in financial information into their criminal investigations. And it's still something that jurisdictions um, around the world continue to struggle with. And that's something that I'll address a, a little bit later on in my remarks. Um, but I think from my own experience working on counter-terrorist financing from the Treasury De Department's perspective, even when I joined Treasury's intelligence shop in 2006, it was only two years old at that point, we were still kind of trying to figure out, kind of making it up as we went along in terms of how to use financial information and financially oriented analysis to be able to uh, support policymakers in their objective to detect, disrupt, um, and dismantle um, uh, terrorist organizations and their, and their financial foundations. And, and that was kind of the mantra, detect, um, disrupt, dismantle. Now, when I was asked for this, um, to think for, for, for this event on um, whether or not the US counterterrorist finance efforts are effective and efficient, um, I kind of wanted to go back first and, and look again at those objectives. See, what, what are we trying to do? And I think that, of course, over time, that strategy has become more sophisticated than those three words. And I think that it's, um, you know, where I found it best articulated was actually in, in remarks that former Assistant Secretary Danny Glazer, testimony that he delivered to the House Foreign, um, Foreign Affairs Committee in 2016 where he, and I'm gonna paraphrase, but basically said that the, the two um, interrelated objectives of counter-terrorist financing are one, cutting off terrorist organizations from access to revenues, and two, cutting them off from the ability um, and the means to move those funds. Um, and both, not just in the formal financial system, but also through formal mechanisms, and even as, as methods of value transfer, which I think is a, a methodology we see more and more um, these days. So, Underlying those two objectives, of course, there's different lines of effort. I think two important ones to focus on have been the efforts to increase transparency in the international financial system. This is you know, a global standard setting effort led by the Financial Action Task Force and its um, recommendations, um, but also you know, where uh, regulators, effective regulation of, of financial institutions and non-financial institutions to ensure that there's trackability and traceability um, in our financial system to ensure that terrorist financiers and other illicit actors cannot operate without being detected. Um, and the second 
line of, of effort would be marshalling um, and employing actionable information to support a range of targeted measures. So this could be financial sanctions, this could be law enforcement action, it could be you know, targeted information sharing with foreign jurisdictions, uh, sharing often sensitive information to give them a chance to act against activity going on within their own area. So knowing that's our, object our objective, what are the, the challenges that we face today? And I think that the challenge can be most easily summarized um, as the fact that the threat of terrorist financing is increasingly complex. Over the, the last decade in particular, I think there's many dynamics that underlie that. Um, you know, one is, is, is counterterrorism efforts and counterterrorist financing efforts specifically, so responses to what we've done. Um, but, but there's three in particular I wanna talk about today. So in terms of those responses, um, as the first one, terrorists have changed their methodologies. And um, I think as, as the authors of this study note, that doesn't necessarily mean they're more sophisticated. I think terrorists are always going to look for what's most efficient and reliable in terms of moving their money and where they think they have the least chance of being detected. So I think this is interesting as you look at um, some of the cases that, that Andrew and John discussed, and particularly those outliers in the, the Zubia Sanaz case, um, this very convoluted kind of money laundering scheme that in many ways could have made her more vulnerable to detection um, than if, if, if the transactions would have been more, more basic and simple. But I think also this, the idea that, um, that many of these actors use money service businesses. I mean, this has long been a preferred way for terrorists to, to move money and continues to be one. Um, but I think it's interesting to note that um, if you look at the suspicious activity reports filed uh, to, to FinCEN, the U.S. Financial Intelligence Agency, consistently over the last, I think, five to eight years is the farthest I've looked back, the majority of those, um, two-thirds of those um, that are flagged as possible terrorist financing come from money service businesses. So they vast outnumber the, the number filed by banks. And this statistic is noted in a 2018 assessment um, risk assessment conducted by the Treasury Department, which, which explains it as, as possibly being a result of the fact that money service businesses usually see both ends of the transaction. So if you're sending from a Western Union to a Western Union, you're going to see that. Banks don't necessarily, necessarily do that. But whether it's because they have more insight into it or because money services businesses are more likely to operate in areas that are unbanked and underbanked, um, on the, on the um, you know, outside of conflict zones um, where they serve a vital role in terms of mean, moving humanitarian assistance and remittances, but also can be easily easy exploited. This is clearly a typology that, that has been identified. Uh, the second one, the second uh, trend, I think, or dynamic that, that is increasing the complexity of, um, of terrorist financing and the threat is, is kind of overall a move to more local uh, to more local financing. So one side of it is what we're talking about is, is the foreign terrorist fighters, loan actors who are going to use money they have or they're going to look at simple frauds or otherwise donations to fund themselves. But the flip side of this, of course, um, you know, at the extreme is, is where you see terrorist organizations. And in my view, I think it's partially in the Middle East where I spend most of my time looking a post-Arab Spring phenomenon where you have the breakdown of political systems, you have conflicts that have endured for, for many years that have spurred sectarianism and extremism, um, that you have terrorists exploiting those openings and being able to take control of territory. And the most obvious example is the Islamic State. But of course, it's not the first terrorist organization to do that. You've seen um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula take control of, um, of uh, Mukalla port in Yemen, uh, Al-Shabaab taking control of Kismayo in both in these situations, besides Shabab's ability, an ongoing ability to extort funds from the population um, in the area where it operates to, to really be very well resourced. Um, and so I think it's not, it's not simply taking territory, but the idea that terrorist organizations are embedding themselves more in these local economies, whether it's through licit activities, such as taking advantage of commercial fronts for procurement, um, or for trade-based money laundering, um, which I think is an emerging um, uh, concern, 
as well related to terrorist financing. We've seen Hezbollah and even Hamas benefit from trade-based money laundering, um, or whether it's illicit, ongoing criminal activity. So um, taking advantage of pre-existing smuggling networks or um, criminal networks, criminal money launderers, um, drug trafficking, et cetera. Um, so this, this has, made, has made it, um, I think, what we see as a result of this localized trend is the idea that we had before, based on a model of Al Qaeda that primary, primarily received its funding from deep pocket donors and exploitation of charitable organizations, that demonstrating, um, focusing solely, or um, I'm sorry, excuse me, that uh, <laughs> focusing primarily on disrupting these external networks is not going to be sufficient that a local response is very much needed. Um, so just quickly, because I, I recognize that I've already uh, used quite a bit of time and I'm really looking forward to the discussion related to this, what can we do to close those gaps? And so there's already a lot of discussion about reform um, within the US AML CFT regime in terms of public pi private partnerships or improving the ability of law enforcement to provide feedback on the information it, see it receives or prioritize things and, and many others. What I would like to just speak about briefly is, is kind of from my experience on the ground working as a financial, financial attache and relating back to this idea of localized um, financing is that when we look at US financial sanctions, um, because of the ubi ubiquity of the dollar, uh, US sanctions are globalized. But in, in many ways, it's not enough for foreign financial institutions to implement these sanctions um, to, to adopt them and run the U.S. list, or even for foreign governments to adopt U.N. level sanctions, um, that it, in order to go beyond simply disrupting this activity to, to truly dismantle, it requires the corollary action within a foreign jurisdiction would be um, prosecution. And the challenge, which this may seem um, fairly basic, but I think that it, it's indeed very complex, the challenge of matching up foreign and domestic agencies um, to be able to truly have a, a international cooperation where information can be exchanged that can support uh, financial investigations, that can support um, prosecutions and eventual um, uh, convictions, is, it, it's, it's a very challenging process to do that. So I think, I think there's more the U.S. could do to support capacity building in foreign governments to, so that they can really engage in these complex financial investigations and prosecutions, and so that we can see financial intelligence play an even greater role in supporting prosecutions as broad, abroad as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was uh, incredibly comprehensive, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, let me just pick up one, uh, before uh, moving to Jessica, one point uh, that you brought up, uh, which has to do with sources. Uh, and you um, brought up the point that indeed, uh, 20 years ago, one would not have had the ability to have all these uh, court cases that talk about the financial component. Indeed, if one reads the 9-11 uh, report, gets a picture of uh, U.S. intel community that is not really well versed in any aspect of terrorism financing. Uh, the FBI or pretty much any other agency did not have uh, a unit specifically devoted to terrorism financing. That, of course, has changed with time and we see the results. At the same time, let me present the flip side uh, of that, which is as great as these documents are. And, of course, in a lot of the work that we do on um, on the ISIS-related mobilization in the U.S., they are the starting point. They do present flaws. They don't give the full, uh, the full picture for a variety of, of reasons. Um, it could be uh, that prosecutors who want to bring charges against an individual might omit the financial component of it because it's easier to prove material support because of other actions carried out by the individual. And then one reads the document, finds no financial component and things, well, there's no financial uh, component there. Well, it's just a prosecutorial choice. It's not necessarily uh, that there, was, there wasn't any. Um, somebody brought up very correctly, and that's uh, Professor Walker from the uh, University of Leeds, that it is possible that more cases are undisclosed and resulted in intelligence gathering and disrupting activities, including informant recruitment, 
rather than uh, um, prosecu arrest, prosecution, and so on and so forth. So obviously there's, uh, uh, there's a variety of reasons why the picture is more complex than that. That's why we um, also try to supplement as much as possible the uh, court records with interviews with national security professionals. And you know, we occasionally get them to, to talk to us, occasionally uh, a bit less, uh, but that's uh, obviously a big, uh, a big part. Um, let me move to Jessica. Uh, we heard uh, uh, in, very, in, in detail from, from Catherine about the US component. Uh, I would uh, appreciate it if you could talk more about the Canadian component and in general, uh, the international uh, perspective on this. Uh, and I would say on both sides of the equation, one would be the dynamics. Uh, I mentioned it to some degree, the results that we see in, um, in the US are not exactly the same dynamics that we see in a lot of other countries. Uh, uh, this unsophistication is not necessarily the case. And secondly, when it comes to countering the phenomenon, what are the perspectives uh, that, you, that you see? Jessica. Thank you. And I want to echo what Kate had to say earlier and really thank everyone for having me here. It's always a real pleasure to talk about terrorist financing, especially with people who really know the subject matter. So to start with, I really want to situate this report both in the literature on terrorist financing as well as counter-terrorist financing practice and scholarship. Um, and first of all, I really want to highlight the, the big debate in counter-terrorist financing. And it's really, do our counter-terrorist financing policies and practices work? And that's a really difficult thing to answer because counter-terrorist financing efforts are rarely well-defined, they're very rarely well-evaluated, and they've changed dramatically over time. So we've really shifted from that follow the money to use financial intelligence to a whole host of other activities within the sort of counter-terrorist financing framework. So figuring out the answer to this big debate is really quite difficult. You know, as Kate was talking about, counter-terrorist financing is meant to deprive terrorists of funds. But I would actually argue that counter-terrorist financing is meant to do something much broader, and that's actually to reduce terrorism writ large. And this is something where we see very little evaluation in terms of those policies and practices. Most evaluations about determining whether states are meeting the FATF recommendations, but interestingly enough, not about whether those recommendations actually do anything to counter the financing of terrorism. So, Part of the problem here is that there's a lot of daylight between how terrorist groups, cells, and individuals finance their activities and the policy and practice of counter-terrorist financing. So for instance, as this report highlights, many terrorist plots and attacks are self-financed or financed through identity-based support networks. But what counter-terrorist financing policies and practices internationally really address this? Um, this is, of course, reflected in the academic literature. There's a literature on terrorist financing, which talks about the methods and mechanisms involved, and a literature on counter-terrorist financing, which talks about the implementation of FATF recommendations, legislation, and evaluation. But they rarely speak to each other, um, and they speak to each other far less than you'd think. Part of this is because the FATF recommendations at their core that address terrorist financing were drafted before we really knew much about terrorist financing, I would argue. If you want to be less charitable, charitable about it, I would say that it was in the absence of considering any of the rebel or insurgent financing literature that led to sort of these broad general recommendations. The other piece in the literature and practice, I would argue, of terrorist and counter-terrorist financing is that there's rarely a distinction being made between organizational and operational financing. So how terrorist groups, cells, and individuals finance, to say nothing of movements, which is something that we're dealing with increasingly today. So, um, you know, ideologies that lack the structure of a group. It's actually not quite true. So there are quite a number of authors who make reference to the distinction between organizational and operational financing, but it rarely sort of permeates their analysis and, and rarely draws really distinct and concrete different recommendations. So you're probably wondering at this point, what does this have to do with this report? Uh, first of all, this report sits squarely in the realm of what I would call operational financial analysis. And that makes it a really important contribution. And one that's actually quite rare in the literature. This isn't about how ISIL funds itself as a group, which I'm very grateful for. I've had about enough of that for a lifetime. 
Uh, instead, it really looks at the individual and in some case small cell financing mechanism. So how these individuals are raising funds for attacks and plots. I would argue that a lot of these findings are also quite consistent with how uh, funding for travel has been, has occurred in particularly in Canada and other jurisdictions. And this level of analysis is quite rare in the literature. It is more common though amongst practitioners. So it's nice to see it kind of come out of that sort of rarefied space. So in a way, this report acts to draw that literature away from that focus on organizational financing and remind us that we really need to look at the different levels of analysis to truly understand terrorist financing. So what we're left with here is analysis that demonstrates how small cell and individual operational financing really needs a new approach. This is only increasingly true with the rise of extremist and terrorist movements. And I would caution here too, that we don't need to re we don't need to throw everything out that we've already been doing because terrorist groups will evolve and terrorist individuals will evolve, but they won't abandon their old methods. They'll just sort of add on new things that are you know, jurisdictionally appropriate or situationally appropriate. Um, so what I would really argue is that we need several approaches to counter terrorist financing, not just one. So how do we go about doing this? First of all, we really need to evaluate our current counter-terrorist financing practices in terms of that levels of financing, specifically organizational and operational. We may find that some of our approaches are appropriate to combating organizational financing of like well-structured groups, for instance, although I suspect that some of these could probably use some refinement. Uh, we also need to think about what, if anything, our counter-terrorist financing practices can bring to detecting and preventing operational financing and frankly, operational activity. In a lot of cases, as this report very much demonstrates, the financing is the least of our worries here. It's really about that terrorist act activity, that operational activity. And this report also points to some very clear ways that operational financing has happened in the US. It has clear parallels to other jurisdictions um, in Canada, Australia, and the UK, although there are some clear differences as well. And we need to tie this information directly to our policies and practices. The other piece I would say is that we also need to be realistic about what we can expect from financial intelligence. While many, including this report, are quite optimistic about the utility of financial intelligence for initiating investigations, in my experience, that's actually quite rare. Instead, it's really human intelligence or signals intelligence or intelligence derived from networks, finance can be part of that, that identifies those needs. We need to be fair in our evaluation of counter-terrorist financing and financial intelligence in this regard. Financial intelligence has a very limited collection platform, and so it's not really fair to compare it to something like human intelligence or signals intelligence that has you know, much more developed and widespread applicability. So we really need to temper our expectations to, in a, to a certain regard. Financial intelligence is also limited in that it can't tell us about somebody's intent, only about their capabilities and level of planning and preparation. So while we do need to reevaluate counter-terrorist financing practices and policies, let's do it fairly um, and help us refine and, not, and, and avoid throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we also, of course, need to expand what we mean by financing. So this report also correctly identifies the mechanisms involved, which is raising, moving, and using funds. We also need to consider other mechanisms though, such as storage, management, and how funds are obscured. And, and the authors really talked around this a fair bit about some of the tradecraft and financial tradecraft involved. We need to be bringing that to the forefront of our analysis of terrorist financing. So with these tools in place and armed with empirical evidence that's drawn from deep case study research like this report, we can identify better tools and practices to counter terrorism writ large. And so with all that being said, I of course like to congratulate the authors on an important contribution to the field. And one that I really think is gonna help change the way we talk about terrorist and counter-terrorist financing. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for the compliments. Uh, really appreciate it. We have a little more than 10 minutes left. Uh, we got a lot of questions from the, the audience, that's always great. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I wrote down five and I'm just gonna, Toss them out there. I think it's uh, up to you. We might go in reverse order. Uh, so starting uh, uh, with Jessica, and you pick one or two, uh, and, and 
the lucky one is left uh, the, at the bottom, and at the end there's going to be Andrews left to the one that nobody likes. Uh, so as a first question, um, which is probably more for, for Jessica and Catherine, which is if you had any thoughts about the latest FinCEN files, uh, and if you want to explain what the FinCEN files would do a much better job than I can. Um, there's a second question, which I guess is more for John and Andrew, which is if we found any connection between the level of education of the individuals and the sophistication in their financing uh, pathways. Uh, a third question is pretty much for everybody. Um, and it's something that we briefly discussed uh, in Andrew's presentation, but it's uh, anything uh, technology. So we talked about how we don't, we haven't seen a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's a lot of literature out there about dark web, deep web, a variety of tools uh, uh, that could be used by, by terrorists. Uh, in the report, at least in the cases we have seen, uh, we haven't found a lot of evidence of that. Again, it could be for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be, as I mentioned earlier, but from a prosecutorial point of view, it might be difficult to collect the evidence of this and the individuals were charged for other, other activities and not for, for that. But how do you see the future of uh, a variety of uh, cyber tools in terrorism financing? Broad question, uh, I will be writing them down or at least uh, thinking about them. Uh, it's about other groups operating in, uh, in the US uh, and how the findings of the report, how ISIS supporters operate differently from them. Uh, we know that groups like uh, Hezbollah and Hamas have long been uh, fundraising in the, in the US. Um, we at the program see this uh, report on ISIS as just part of a much larger uh, project that looks at terrorism financing across groups and across ideologies and we've started to work on how certain right-wing um, neo-Nazi movements uh, uh, are active when it comes to fundraising. But what do you see uh, the differences with, with other groups? And finally, uh, a question uh, uh, about how some of these cases comes from a uh, delegation of the European Union to the US. Uh, can you tell us something about the way these cases were detected, discovered by law enforcement and intelligence agencies? So let's start with Jessica. A couple of questions, one or two questions each. Well, it really should be Kate who describes what the FinCEN files are. <laughs> um, but brought, but in, in short order, it's really about, um, so the suspicious activity reports get reported to the U.S.'s Financial Intelligence Unit, and they actually ended up getting leaked to uh, media, media sources. And in terms of their impact on counter-terrorist financing or terrorist financing, I would say so far from what I've seen, there's been only peripheral uh, information about terrorist financing, because most of it's really relating to the purpose of the disclosure, which seemed to be pretty anti-Trump. Um, so I'll let Kate talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I'll go on to talk through a couple more of the questions. So in terms of technology and terrorist financing, um, I actually did a report not that long ago for Rusi on, on this topic. Um, and I would say that a lot of technologies are being used by terrorist actors. Um, so it's like crowdfunding for sure, um, cryptocurrencies, yes, um, other payment mechanisms like on online payment mechanisms. But the thing is, it's, as I said during my talk, it's not really the replacement of old methods, it's just adding on new techniques. So when you're in a jurisdiction where cryptocurrency is used, that's something that you'll see in your terrorist financing cases. If it's a cash-based economy, you're going to see cash in your terrorist financing cases for the most part. The challenge here, of course, is that for almost every jurisdiction though, you need to be aware of how terrorist financing can happen through all of the new technologies that exist. And that's a real challenge for investigators in countries where you, know, you don't necessarily have a lot of cryptocurrency use. You still have to know how to detect it, even though it's not in common use. So it's quite a, it's quite a conundrum at the international level. And in terms of differences with other groups, um, I actually see a lot of similarities across the spectrum um, from in terms of how terrorist actors, and I'm using that term broadly, uh, raise funds and move funds and all that kind of stuff. The real differences for me are in the level of activity. So if it's organizational or operational, if it's operational, you're looking at smaller levels of funds, 
often raised in the jurisdiction or close to the jurisdiction where the attack will occur, uh, that kind of thing. And organizationally, it's a lot more, and there's a lot of nuance amongst all the groups, but we will get into that. Right, Catherine. Okay, so on the FinCEN files question, um, so, so as Jessica said, this was a disclosure of um, information reported to uh, FinCEN. Um, and I think, you know, as a, as a researcher now in my current incarnation, um, I get a little excited about, you know, information um, that, that becomes available through it. But as a former government official, I think, you know, it's important to note that this, this was an illegal disclosure. I think what Jessica referenced about it possibly being politically motivated, I know this, this has been kind of mentioned in various places that it could be tied to someone who leaked information related to, um, to the president, but I actually haven't seen that confirmed. So, so I, don't, um, I, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, what the nature of the leak is, and I think there's an ongoing investigation into that. I think just generally um, that, I think some of the reporting on the leaks has been somewhat sensational or, or, or hyperbolic. I think it's hard to tell the way that the, the information is being um, made available, uh, you know, a lot about the transactions. There's a lot of circumstances under which banks would report information um, like that that's been disclosed. And I think that kind of overall, there's been a reaction that these are, that, that banks kind of have a binary choice between um, rejecting a transaction or, or taking a fee and processing a transaction, um, even though they may know that it's suspicious. And that's not, that's not the only dynamic and it's also not a binary choice. They have lots of options to continue to investigate, um, to ask for additional information from senders until they feel um, comfortable with it. So I think that there's, there's, there's somewhat, in some of the reporting, there's a lack of nuance. So I think everyone should just kind of um, be, be careful when they're looking at that, ascribing a lot of certainty, just because this is leaked information that may give it, um, people may ascribe more value to it than I, than I think it deserves in the way that it's presented in a lot of the reporting. Um, in terms of, of the use of technologies, um, I think I, I just wanted to kind of note that that I think with with cryptocurrencies, um, you know what you see one thing which is the sometimes the the misperception um, of anonymity uh, and actually that it is quite possible to trace cryptocurrencies um, and that that is a tool that law enforcement is employing. And there was an interesting case just a couple of weeks ago where the uh, U.S. Department of Justice um, released. Uh, uh, information um, or indictments related to, to, I think it was three different uh, terror financing or, or use of, of, of um, different technologies, including by the Islamic State, which was trying to set up a, a false front to sell um, uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and there was also the, the you know, Hamas efforts to try to, to raise Bitcoin um, online. And so I think that, that we'll continue to see more of that um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, it's a very interesting and dynamic field right now in cryptocurrency. And I think that there's the potential for there to be greater adoption. But I think as that happens, um, you know, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that I think regulation will be able to, um, to, to put in place the same sort of traceability and trackability um, that, uh, that has been in place in other sorts of financial transactions. And so I think what, what may be most likely is this sort of bifurcation of the marketplace where you have a dark web and you have, um, you know, uh, uh, anonymous coins that are used there, but, but you would have more stable coins and, and, and marketplace in, in the, the other, um, uh, milieu that will develop. Um, I think given time, I'll leave it at that. But, um, if, if there's I'm another one I forgot, Catherine, if you don't mind, I wanted to say a couple of things about Hamas and Hezbollah, if you can. If you just uh, elaborate a bit about what do you see fundraising in the States of those two groups. So I think with, with Hamas, um, there's some historical examples. I think that right now Hamas is fairly isolated financially. Um, I, 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 um, off the top of my head, I can't really, uh, I, I don't know of any recent examples of Hamas fundraising in the United States. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, Hamas has, has struggled because of events in the Middle East to retain a lot of its financing relationships and access to activities that it would derive revenue from. 
Um, and so, so it's fairly isolated at this point. Um, in terms of Hezbollah fundraising in the United States, um, you know, there's there's been cases, and of course, my my colleague Matt Levitt is is the the you know wrote the book literally on Hezbollah um, and can speak to this in his new tool that he's released that um, maps Hezbollah activity could show you exactly where this fundraising activity um, is. But I think you know overall, kind of what you're seeing with with Hezbollah fundraising is um, along the lines of the themes I outlined in terms of, um, you know, em looking more to embed in, uh, you know, existing criminal activity. Um, you know, Hezbollah's always relied on a global support network for fundraising and support. Um, and I think that as they've come under additional pressure because of uh, you know, pressure that's been put on Iran as their finances have come under pressure. There's only reason to believe that they would rely on those external networks to a greater degree. Um, but but I would I would really refer you to to Matt for a specific example of the United States. Okay. Thank you, uh, John. Um, all right, very quickly on a couple, just uh, for time, um, education versus sophistication. Um, I don't think we have a clear profile, um, certainly no kind of causal relationship there. I mean, we know, for example, Zubia Shanaz was a lab tech, and she engaged in kind of the most um, sophisticated one. Uh, I think we've seen, you know, um, sophisticated plots done by people who are not necessarily, you know, college graduates or holding, you know, PhDs. We've also seen the inverse. So um, on that, I would say we don't have a clear clear profile to paint that with a broad brush. Um, how the cases were detected, I would say based on court documents and our conversations um, with law enforcement and NATSEC professionals, um, I think based on the, on, the, on the findings of this report, I don't think a lot of them came from the traditional um, you know, financial triggers uh, from a bank or a reporting institution, um, simply because of the nature of a lot of this movement, um, which Andrew laid out in his in his presentation, I think a lot of it, anecdotally at least, came from uh, the more traditional law enforcement um, measures. Obviously, um, they're not going to play their whole hand uh, if they don't have to. Um, and then last, on other groups, I would say, again, anecdotally, um, uh, you know, in Europe, there's that more overt white power uh, music scene. There's more overt fundraising, apparel, that kind of thing. Uh, the groups in the US, um, again, it seems anecdotally low level. Um, I would say, the core challenges in the U.S. of countering kind of that, that neo-Nazi white supremacist, whether it's groups like Adam Waffen, the base, or even some of the anti-government stuff like the Bugula movement, um, you know, is kind of twofold in that, um, you know, we don't have a domestic terrorism statute and we don't have um, any white supremacist overseas groups on the FTO list. So with ISIS, you have the, the material support to an FTO where if an individual exchanges money with another individual in the intent to give that money to the Islamic State, that's material support. If a white supremacist gives money to a white supremacist, that's just a legal financial transaction unless it's, you know, in furtherance of a clear plot that's, that's prevented. Um, so I think it's, you know, much in the same lines as this report. Um, a lot of these trends that we outlined here um, will likely continue to pose problems um, as we kind of see the, the, the rise in these, in, the, in these kind of varied actors in, in the U.S. Andrew, final thoughts? Um, I, I know we are short on time, so I think um, I think most of those questions have been addressed. I, I would just like to kind of bring it back out to a comment that just made on uh, kind of looking at when we look at the operational level, um, things like education and some of these other factors that we tend to look at when we look at um, fine, uh, terrorism cases writ large may not give us as much as we need. In, the, in this case, terrorism financing at the operational level is often the final kind of the final say in in the prosecution right it's the final indication that this individual does in fact support this group and this is a forms of communication as kate mentioned right um that differs wildly when we kind of go up the scale to the organizational level but when we're looking at it down here um it's it's important to as both of our panelists have mentioned think about asking ourselves those questions what what is the application of these policies here at the operational level so i'll i'll finish there Great, fantastic. Uh, well, we're short on time. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Jessica and Catherine for joining us today. Thank you for your, your insights. Uh, Andrew and John, of course, great co-authoring a, a report for you, for, uh, with you, and thanks for your comments. And again, uh, for everybody else, thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, the report is available online. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at another POE event. Thank you very much. Goodbye.